everybody is ready. So I think we're ready to go. Great, so um, good morning everyone um, and welcome to this um, session this morning. My name is Dr. Jennifer Hanratty um, and I work with um, colleagues, Professor Sarah Miller and Dr. Kira Keenan um, at the Centre for Evidence and Social Innovation um, and we represent Campbell UK and Ireland. And this morning we're going to be talking about a series of three reviews um, that we conducted on interventions that are aimed at um, preventing homelessness. Um, and so I'm going to kick off and explain, um, take you on a little bit of a journey through the process of, of how we came to be doing these reviews um, and how they worked. And they're slightly different from traditional systematic reviews. Um, and I will hand over to Kira, who will lead you through the um, review that she did on accommodation based interventions. Um, and then Sarah, um, then I will talk about um, interventions to um, interventions for people who are discharging from um, institutional settings. Um, and then Sarah will talk about um, the review that she led on access, improving access to health and social care. Um, and then Sarah will sum up and then we will have some time for questions at the end. Um, so please do um, keep a note of your questions, put your questions into the chat um, as we go or, or make a note so that you can ask them um, yourself at the end. But thanks all for joining us. And I'm just gonna share my screen here. Uh, So yes, I think this is the first event of the um, Festival of Social Sciences. So welcome everyone and, and thanks for joining us this morning. So as I said, um, we are um, based in Queen's University in the Centre for Evidence and Social Innovation. We'll talk about these three. Numbers of these schemes before. Yep. So um, there's somebody just with their um, mic not muted. So if everybody can make sure that they have their, their microphones muted, um, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so we're, we're talking about a series of three reviews that we led, um, but we, we represent Campbell UK in Ireland. Um, and we're a national centre of the International Campbell Collaboration and the Campbell Collaboration um, works to produce evidence syntheses and systematic reviews on social sciences topics. So we have a number of established groups. Um, so we host the education coordinating group um, within our centre um, in Belfast. Um, there's also a social welfare group, which is the group that are, is publishing these reviews with us. And um, there's also an international development group, a group on disability, um, business and management. There's a whole range of um, new groups that have just um, started as well. So Campbell Collaboration covers a whole wide, a wide range of topics. And we're one of the first national centres um, for the collaboration. And we both produce evidence synthesis and systematic reviews, but we also advocate for their better use of systematic reviews in, in policy and practice. And for those of you who aren't aware of what systematic reviews are, essentially what a systematic review aims to do is to gather all of the research that's been conducted to answer a specific question. Um, and so what we do is we aim to find all of the relevant research, sift through it to figure out what is what research is eligible and um, to answer the question that you've set out um, at the beginning of your review process. You extract the data from, from each individual study assess the quality of those studies, and then combine the data together in a meta-analysis. Um, so the aim is to conduct a synthesis of all the research that's been conducted. Um, their systematic reviews are um, unique in that they have um, a plan or a protocol um, in advance so that you say exactly what you're going to do before you do it. Um, and that is uh, designed to reduce bias um, in the process so that we, we can't be accused of going and just choosing the studies that show positive effects or only choose the studies that, that we like, um, that we actually set a plan in place beforehand to say exactly what studies we're going to include um, and what we won't include, and then we follow through with that plan. Um, systematic reviews also have a comprehensive search process to, to try to find all of the existing evidence, so not just published evidence that's published in academic databases, but also evidence that's maybe published by organisations um, or on websites um reports from various different charities and things like that so we would include all of that in our comprehensive search process um, and the systematic reviews may or may not include um, meta-analysis and systematic reviews um will often be a, a synthesis of qualitative studies or quantitative studies but also we can do syntheses of qualitative information and these three reviews in particular take a mixed methods um approach and why would we want to use systematic reviews um, rather than a, a, a traditional types of literature review or narrative review? So the narrative reviews of evidence can, are often not transparent um, in the method. 
user they're not systematic so that leaves, leaves them open to bias um, essentially if you if you want to review um, an intervention that you like you might go and look for evidence that's going to support works when actually you may have missed a whole lot of studies that say that the intervention doesn't actually work and the advantage of systematic reviews is that you you are trying at every stage of the process to reduce that bias that you're looking for all of the studies and that you're systematically going through and extracting the data in the same way for each studies um, and, and I'm sure that many, many members of the audience are aware that there's lots of different policies programs or interventions out there um, in the area of homelessness that might have face appeal that might seem like a good idea but there's not actually the evidence there to support them. Um, and so with this process, so what, what we did, I mentioned at the beginning that these reviews are slightly different um, from traditional systematic reviews and that we started with an evidence and gap map. So an evidence and gap map is essentially a map of all of the existing evidence on a particular theme. So while a systematic review tends to focus on relatively narrow question that can be answered um, in, in a very discreet way. The evidence and gap maps are, are much more broad than that. So they'll typically take on a broad topic area like homelessness. Um, so there are two maps that were commissioned by the Centre for Homelessness Impact, um, which is a relatively new charity that aims to improve the use of evidence in the area of homelessness. And the two evidence and gap map map evidence and gap maps that were commissioned by the Centre for Homelessness Impact. Um, one looked at the effectiveness of interventions um, to prevent or reduce homelessness, and the other map looked at the qualitative evidence on the implementation of interventions. And so what the evidence and gap map can do is gives us a visual, and usually it's an interactive um, map of the evidence that exists, but also the gaps that in that evidence base. And the map, how the maps are organized is usually decided in advance with people who use the map. So in the case of Centre for Homelessness Impact, um, they engage with um, academics, policymakers, practitioners, and service users to conduct, um, to create the framework for the map. And then um, a team in, in Campbell collaboration were commissioned to produce them, the two different maps. So the maps include both primary studies and systematic reviews and the maps are really powerful because they can show us where the evidence is and also where the gaps are but the maps don't tell us what the evidence actually says and so the next step in the process is actually to conduct a systematic review to find out well okay if we can see here in this part of the map there's enough evidence that hasn't been subject to a systematic review we then need to take that next step to actually find out well, what is that evidence able to tell us about the effectiveness um, of the intervention. Um, and so the evidence, if you can see from, from the gap map on, on the previous slide, where the evidence is sparse, one of the options, the only option really is to fill in the gaps with new primary research. But then when we see there's densely populated little square where there's lots of evidence, but no evidence synthesis, then that's where we step in essentially. Um, and in collaboration with the Centre for Homelessness Impact, we decided on three separate review questions. So the first um, review is about the effectiveness of accommodation-based interventions. The second was the effectiveness of discharge programmes. And the third on the accessibility of health and social care services. Um, and for these three reviews, we did the screening um, in tandem. So essentially, we were working on the three reviews at the same time. So what we did was we looked at the effectiveness map and the implementation map that already existed and then screened each of the studies within those maps to see whether or not they were relevant um, to one of the three reviews and you can see that some some of the studies would have been relevant to more than one review so there, there, there's some overlap between the um, reviews and our intention was that for the implementation studies we wanted to identify where we had studies on the effectiveness of the intervention then go to the implementation map and find any studies that actually looked at the implementation of that particular intervention and that was the plan but that's not what happened in in practice um in the inclusion criteria for all of the studies um, we used um studies where there was a comparison group so for um ran we included randomized trials as the kind of gold standard and um, but we also included studies where there were some kind of comparison group either a matched control or, or a waiting um a waiting list um comparison 
are similar. So on all three systematic reviews focused on people who were currently experiencing or at risk of experiencing homelessness, and that was irrespective of age or gender. So essentially including anybody who was deemed to be at risk of homelessness. Um, both the maps only included evidence from high income countries. And so that's what we included in our reviews. And then the settings um, for the three reviews are slightly different. So for um, the accommodation reviews, um, any form of accommodation, um, hostels, shelters, community housing, um, etc. For the discharge review, we included um, any settings where the accommodation was provided by that setting, essentially. Um, so that would, could be um, people who were discharging from a prison setting, leaving inpatient hospital treatment, um, military, um, addiction, substance abuse treatment, or um, young people who were leaving the care system. Um, and for the access review, we included um, studies that were conducted in a community setting. For the data extractions, this is when we got all of the studies together, we then extract all of the um, numerical data and um, qualitative data um, from the studies. So that's done very carefully and it's done separately by two different people. Um, and the reason that we do it separately, and we do it separately with two different people, and then we come together to compare what we've extracted and, make, and check. Um, and we also separately assess the quality of the study. And the reason that we do that is to make sure that we are um, keeping the quality um, of what we're doing quite high. Um, so there's evidence to suggest that if you have one person does the data extraction and then somebody else comes along and check it, you're less likely to catch any errors because you're more likely to agree with your colleagues. Whereas if you do it separately and then compare, you're more likely to, um, to get robust assessment of the quality um, and data extraction without errors. Um, we extracted information um, on the setting um, where the intervention was, was conducted and then study characteristics like the design, sample size, information about the population, um, etc. We also extracted information on who funded the studies and any potential conflicts of interest in the studies that might um, indicate that there may be bias in the results of the study. Um, we also then ex as, as extracted qualitative information on factors that affected the implementation um, of these interventions. Um, and for the outcomes, for the three reviews, um, there was overlap between the outcomes. So essentially what we did, we looked at any um, data on any of the eight outcomes that you can see there on the slide. Um, but we prioritized um, housing stability for the accommodation-based interventions, which is obviously the, the key outcome um, for those kind of interventions. And for the discharge program, there were two primary outcomes of interest. So the first being housing stability and the second being health. And then for access to health and social services, obviously the, the most relevant outcome is access to services, but we extracted data on all of the outcome um, domains that you can see there, including any adverse effects that were reported um, by the interventions, which is quite important because we wanted to make sure that um, these interventions weren't causing any unintended harms um, as well. And so I'll hand over to um, Kira to talk about the um, accommodation review. Thanks, Jen. And I'm just going to start um, to share my screen now. OK, so um, for some reason, my, my Zoom view has changed, so I'm going to try and get it back to the way it was. OK. So um, my name is Kira Keenan. I am a research fellow in Campbell UK in Ireland, and I'm also the associate director of Cochrane in Ireland. Um, I'm going to talk about the accommodation-based systematic review. Sorry, I've just noticed that I'm not full screen for you guys. Um, although I'm the presenting author for this review today, um, the work couldn't have been accomplished for, without the, the collaboration with my co-authors. So we have um, myself, Sarah, Jen and Terry as the quantitative methods um, experts. We had Jane and Chris who were research assistants on the project. And then we had um, Peter, Suzanne and John who were the content experts of this review. Um, so homelessness affects individuals who are currently living their lives without um, access to safe um, and adequate housing. Um, devastatingly, it affects um, almost 1.6 billion people in the world. Um, 
we recognize homelessness as a multifaceted and very complex issue. Um, and because of this, many accommodation-based approaches have been developed um, to try and resolve um, this issue. Um, however, homelessness does continue to rise and with the current pandemic, um, it's set to, to keep rising, unfortunately. So the objectives of this um, systematic review on accommodation um, was to assess the effectiveness of accommodation-based interventions on, on outcomes um, which Jen has outlined. Um, we were also interested in the type of intervention which was most or least effective compared to other interventions. Um, and these were compared to, to standard care. So those groups that received um, whatever homelessness support was available in their context. We also wanted to know who um, the accommodation based interventions worked best for. Um, another thing that we looked at was whether the geographical spread of housing, so whether it was scattered site or a conglomerate type of housing made any difference. Um, and then finally, Jane Hamilton, who was our qualitative um, evidence synthesis expert, um, she assessed the implementation and process factors which might have um, impacted on the intervention delivery. So um, one of the first things that we noticed when we started to investigate this body um, of literature, which was available in the effectiveness map, was that the way in which the accommodation based um, approaches were implemented in practice were very disorganized and, and, and quite messy. Um, and we find that the this description of categories meant that that um, there wasn't a clear cut definition um, that applied across all contexts. So for example, you know, the, the description of support at housing in the US context was very different from um, support at housing in the UK context. Um, so it became apparent very early on that the review team would have to create um, meaningful categorizations to allow a functional um, and, and ultimately useful comparison between the different types of interventions that existed. Um, and this is a really important part of this review because um, it, it provides a comparative framework that policymakers and, and funders can, can use to understand um, exactly what it is that makes um, the different accommodation um, based approaches work. Um, so to develop this typology, there were a number of stages and we used an iterative decision model. So the review team selected a random sample of papers um, from the evidence and gap map and we independently um, read and coded the characteristics and hypotheses concepts which were related to each of the interventions. Um, and then sat down and compared notes on those. Um, this independent analysis made sure that there was both objectivity and consistency um, during that step of the process. Um, and it allowed us as well to investigate um, really large amounts of data um, without, without a bias or, or a predetermined hypothesis about what the outcome might be. Um, so those emerging themes were collated early on um, and reviewers can communicate it consistently um, to really understand the patterns that were emerging through these papers. Um, and then we were finally able to conclude that the most suitable way to create meaningful categorizations for these types of intervention um, would be based around the um, intensity, um, which we would define as the level of support offered. Um, we also noticed that the interventions varied a lot on whether the user of the intervention um, had any behavioral conditions applied to, to access. Um, so those conditions included, um, you know, need, needing to abstain from, from alcohol or, or substance use, or it might've been, you can only access this if you've got um, no criminal record or, um, you can live in this type of supported housing, but you need to gain employment after six months or you'll no longer have access to it. So to really, you know, describe the interventions well, we also um, 
described whether or not the, the person had um, a condition placed upon them or whether the intervention was offered unconditionally. So this is what the typology looked like in practice. Um, when we developed this typology, we also shared this with a group of um, experts in the field of homelessness to ensure that it worked. So um, to ask them for these types of intervention interventions, um, would they fit in, in this framework? Um, and we had a po really positive response from that. Um, and we also knew that, that the interventions which were included in our review did fit in one of these categories. And um, so you'll see that the, the categorized interventions are based on the, the type of accommodation that was offered and the level of support that was um, provided alongside the accommodation. And then importantly, whether there was a rule placed um, on the individual. Um, I apologize if this is a bit small, but um, it, is, it is available in the, in the finished report, which you'll find on the Center for Homeless Impact webpage. Um, and I'll share a link to that in the final slide as well. Um, so the quantitative research in this review um, provides an overview of the research that exists um, across 51 articles, um, uh, so 51 um, studies of effectiveness um, across 28 papers. So 25 of those 28 papers are from the USA um, two were from Canada and one was from the UK. Um, across all 28 papers, the quality of the research was generally quite low um, and importantly represents weaknesses in the evidence base. Um, the qualitative data was, was uh, more geographically dispersed um, and presents um, an evaluation of an intervention which was conducted in the United Kingdom, two in Ireland, one in Australia, one across um, Europe, so in multiple settings. Um, and then the remaining five were carried out in North America, three of those in, in the United States and, and two in Canada. Um, the quality of these evaluations um, from the implementation map was average, um, but none of them directly um, evaluated the effectiveness interventions. Um, so there isn't a clear linkage between the qualitative and the quantitative um, reports. So we conducted a network meta-analysis um, on our primary outcome, which was housing stability. Um, and it demonstrates that the interventions which offered the highest levels of support um, and didn't place any conditions on, on the user um, were most effective at improving housing stability um, compared to the, the basic type of support um, of, a, of unconditional housing um, and also in comparison to, to a no intervention control group. Um, these, these results are, are quite similar to a meta-analysis that was conducted across housing first interventions. Um, which, which is what we would expect because housing first interventions um, would be most like that, that um, category in the typology and that they, they generally offer really high levels of support and don't um, place behavioral conditions on, on the user. Um, we also conducted network meta-analysis on health outcomes um, and that network meta-analysis demonstrated that the interventions which were categorized as offering um, moderate levels of support and then high levels of support um, were the most effective in improving health outcomes um, compared to the no intervention control groups. Um, these effects though, as you can see, were quite smaller than those obser observed for the housing stability outcome. Um, and then depending on the context, um, finding accommodation for those who need it um, is, is hugely hindered by the supply and affordability in the, in the housing market. Um, and then also the social welfare approach in each jurisdiction um, will also impact heavily on the support available and influences um, some of the preju prejudice and stigma that surrounding homelessness. Um, the evaluations um, which, which were summarized from the, the implementation map 
um, emphasise the need for collaboration and a shared commitment between policymakers, funders and practitioners, um, which creates a, a community and buy-in across sectors and agencies. Um, but, but coordinating this um, is very difficult and requires sustainability to work. Um, we also found that for those implementing programmes, um, it, 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 one of the key themes that emerged was that it was very important to invest the time um, in developing a culture to build the trust and solid relationships um, and identifying the sufficient resources and appropriate referral routes allowed for better implementation planning. Um, and, then, and then the final thing is that involving the staff and caseworkers um, in creating these processes really help to drive the enthusiasm um, and the energy for the service itself. So the, the, the key take home messages, I guess, is that the network meta-analysis suggests that, that all types of accommodation except for those which um, offered very basic or unconditional types of, of support um, improved outcomes across housing stability and health. Um, and then the qualitative evidence raised a primary issue in relation to the context, um, which was the lack of stable, affordable accommodation um, and the variability in the, in the rental market, um, such that actually sourcing the accommodation to provide for individuals who are homeless is extremely challenging. Um, but to read, to read this in, in in more detail, um, the report itself is available on the Centre for Homelessness Impact webpage, which is the link at the top of the screen. Um, but I think it, it's it's very important to also read the, the account of um, the, the lived experience expert, um, Hannah Green, who um, has spent time living in a, in a hostel um, for, for homeless individuals and she explained why and um, perhaps in, in, in better detail why um, these basic types of, of support which um, don't place any conditions on the participant might lead to worse outcomes um, and, and for me that that's a really important response to this review as well. So thank you. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, and pass you over now to Jen, who will talk about the um, discharge review. Thanks, Kira. And yeah, I absolutely echo what Kira just said about um, reading the lived experience. It was really um, complimentary insight um, from the from the person who's who's had experience with those accommodation um, interventions. It's, it's, a, it's a good read. Um, so I'm going to talk about the review that I led on discharge programmes um, for people who are experiencing or at risk of experiencing homelessness. Um, and this, I led this review um, supported by Sarah, um, Jane Hamilton, Christopher Coughlin, um, Kira Keenan and um, our homeless expert, um, Peter Mackey. Um, so for this, um, review, we looked at people who were leaving um, institutional settings because we know that these um, people might be at increased risk of homelessness. And um, so this particular group of people will often have additional needs. Um, like if somebody who is um, coming out of a prison setting, they might have parole conditions that dictate where they can live or who they are allowed to live with. And um, people coming out of a hospital setting might have additional um, needs um, or people coming out of um, or treatment for addiction, obviously, going back into a setting where there's drug use happening is not going to be conducive to their um, recovery. So there's a, a range of reasons why um, this group of people might be at increased risk of um, homelessness. And the programmes that we're looking at in this review aim to avoid discharging into homelessness um, or into unsuitable or unstable um, accommodation. Um, and typically the programmes do that through advanced planning and coordination of services. So we didn't put any limits on the types of interventions um, that we were going to include in this review. So essentially it's any programme that's aimed at this um, particular um, group of, of people. Um, so the objectives in this review um, was to understand what the effect of the discharge programmes are um, for people who are at risk of homelessness. Um, we also wanted to know whether the um, programme effects differ depending on the setting that people are being discharged from, um, the complexity of needs, um, 
the age of the people involved in the studies and whether or not there were any differences between um, interventions for families um, versus those um, for single individuals. Um, and then we also wanted to look at the implementation and process factors that implement on the programme effectiveness. Um, and finally, we wanted to ask whether the effectiveness of the intervention related to how well or how faithfully the intervention was delivered. Um, but unfortunately for um, that question, we actually didn't have enough evidence um, to be able to answer that question, unfortunately. Um, for this review, we um, included 13 studies um, overall. Um, so the, there was 4,909 people um, included in 13 studies. Um, eight of the studies that were included were actually randomized controlled trials, and then there were five non-randomized trials. Um, in terms of the settings, most of the studies um, were conducted um, in healthcare facilities, so people who were leaving um, hospital after a period of um, inpatient treatment. Um, three were for people who were leaving a prison setting, um, one on um, people who were leaving addiction um, treatment, and there was just one study on young people who were leaving care or aging out of the care system. All of the studies that we found were conducted in America. Um, so that obviously um, presents some challenges to interpreting the evidence for a, a UK context. Um, and the majority of studies um, were on men. Um, so there were 79% um, men on average within the studies, um, but it ranged from 57% sort of male participants to 100% right, to um, men. So women are underrepresented in these studies. Um, the people were on average age 35, but ranged between 18 and 70. Um, and actually all of the people um, in these studies were identified as having um, complex needs so that in addition to um, being homeless or being at risk of homelessness, there were also additional needs in terms of physical health or mental health or addiction, treat, addiction um, issues. The studies overall um, were of mixed quality. Um, so 31% were low risk of bias, which means that we think that they were well conducted high quality studies um, and just under 70% were either moderate or high risk of bias. Um, and so the, the overall quality isn't, isn't great. Um, and the interventions themselves, so there was a diverse set of interventions that were identified and they were slightly different um, depending on the setting that people were um, coming from, but overall they typically included some kind of advanced planning before the point of discharge and that the interventions in general, not all of them, but in general, they tended to focus on the individual needs of that participant. So it wasn't a one size fits all approach um, interventions. They were based on looking at what each individual person's needs were and then trying to um, coordinate the delivery of multiple services to meet those individual needs. And the interventions ranged in duration from between one month um, to up to two years of support. Um, and most of the interventions did directly provide some form of um, accommodation, either temporary or permanent com accommodation. Um, so were the discharge programmes effective? Well, yes, um, it appears that they are um, effective. At substan they, uh, they substantially improved housing stability. Um, we found that um, we found a standardised mean difference of 0.7, which indicates a substantial improvement in housing stability. Um, we also found that the programmes did appear to reduce the number of rehospitalizations. So these were um, the studies where people were coming out of um, inpatient um, treatment setting. Um, they people who received the intervention were much less likely to return to hospital um, in the, in the follow up period. Um, unfortunately, none of the studies reported data on access to services. Um, and we did find um, some indication that there was a reduction in the odds of um, incarceration um, after these interventions. Um, and so the, the, there's a small number of studies, um, and so we're not totally confident in that result, but it appears that there, there may be um, some positive effect um, on reducing the odds of um, somebody either going back into prison or, or being imprisoned in the follow-up period. Um, none of the studies reported any usable data on employment and income. We did also find some limited evidence on the imp on improvement in capabilities and well-being. So there was a small number of studies there again, but they tended to focus on um, either quality of life and well-being or quality of relationships and connection to um, the social world, um, essentially, so improvements in family relationships or relationships with um, the people that they live with. Um, so there was some limited evidence, um, but positive. Um, the interventions, it appears that they may be cost effective, um, but there were no good cost benefit analyses um, in any of the studies that we looked at. 
And so the problem is that the, the studies tend to report how much the intervention cost, but they don't then put that in the context of how much the negative outcomes that it prevented would cost otherwise. Um, and so we know that you know, somebody going into hospital, somebody going into prison, um, homelessness, that these, these things are expensive um, for the taxpayers. So we need more studies that will actually put the cost of the intervention into the, co the context of the cost savings that the intervention might deliver. Um, and then we did find um, one concerning outcome um, for adverse effects that um, there was some indication in three combined the results of three studies that looked at the number of people who unfortunately died um, after the study, um, that the intervention group appeared to have slightly higher rate of death um, than the control groups. Um, but the problem here is that because death is a rare outcome, we need more studies to be able to say with confidence whether that was due to the interventions themselves or whether it was just it, it just happened um, as a matter of chance. Um, so it's something to be cautious about, but we, I, we wouldn't come to any conclusions about that at the moment. Um, and in terms of the implementation, so as I mentioned before, the our initial plan was to look at studies linked, uh, implementation studies that were linked to the studies that we included in the effectiveness portion of the review, but they didn't exist um, with just one exception. Um, and so we had to change um, tactics slightly in that we then wanted to look at the available evidence that would talk in general terms about these types of programs. So it's not specifically related to the programs that were included in the effectiveness um, part of the review. So we identified um, 10 studies um, through purpose of sampling. And what we mean there is that we were looking for studies that were gonna give us um, Good coverage in terms of geographic spread and because we saw that all of the effectiveness studies were conducted in America we wanted to actually get um, a more representative sample of in the qualitative studies and um, so we had four studies from the UK, four from America, two from Australia and one from Canada and we also chose um, qualitative studies that were would represent a range of different settings and um, so that we could get a broader sense um, of the applicability of our conclusions to a range of different settings. Um, in terms, and, and we then structured the um, assessment of these qualitative studies or the conclusions that we were able to draw from these studies um, into five different categories. So we, first we looked at the context, um, and I suppose it's an obvious point, but the availability of housing, employment, and the welfare safety net will assess acts that, yeah, basically if we have housing, we can then provide people with housing. But if the context means that if there's no housing available, well, then the interventions can't be implemented successfully. Um, so if that safety net isn't there, these interventions won't be able to be um, implemented. Um, at the level of policymakers and fun funders, I think something that was quite interesting that emerged was that a commitment from policymakers and funders to prevent rather than to manage homelessness was quite important. Um, and so it's this shift in thinking from managing the number of people who are sleeping rough to actually focusing on preventing people from becoming homeless in the first place and, and and when that shift happens there's more focus on these kinds of preventive interventions and more support and more policy and resources invested in um, in these interventions and it appears that longer term funding and joint commissioning of interventions might be um, a positive in terms of the implementation of these interventions so essentially if you have um, an intervention that's working um, to prevent to to improve health outcomes for people leaving the prison setting it makes sense for um, the different departments responsibility for those two um, those two two separate things would actually work together to commission um, these interventions um, in terms at the level of sort of program administrators managers or, or the people who are implementing the interventions it was really important um, to have buy-in um, with the leadership and that the um, approach to preventing homelessness was reflected in the culture and priorities of the agencies implementing the um, programs. We also always saw that um, robust and flexible referral mechanisms were quite important and having a single point of contact with good data sharing was important to make sure that people didn't fall through the cracks. So with, with these interventions where somebody is transitioning, where the responsibility for that person lies with the institution and then transitioning into um, living in the community, it can be quite easy for those people to, to, to fall through the cracks. 
um, when the responsibility is transferred. So having a single point of contact with good data sharing between all of the coordinated the agencies involved and um, in that person's care and support, it was quite important. Um, one thing that came out um, was that the programs can be implemented, but they might not actually be implemented on the ground. Um, so the idea that if the, the intervention is there and the intervention will work, but if the intervention, people who are delivering the intervention don't stick to the protocol, they're not doing it right, then it's unlikely to actually work. Um, and then we also identified the um, importance of providing enough resources so in terms of time, um, staff time, um, money to access services um, and housing and the facilities um, to support people. Um, and a, a level of staff buy-in again emerged as being quite important um, and the importance of good communication with clients and then with other agencies was found to be quite important and this is a similar point in that not for people to not fall through the cracks, we need to have good communication between um, the agencies responsible for that person's um, care. And then we also saw that training and responsibility was quite important. So training, obviously, that um, staff feel competent and they're well trained so that they can deliver the intervention, but also having a sense of responsibility that actually preventing homelessness and making sure that that individual is looked after is part of their job. And um, because if that's not seen as part of their job, then it's easy for um, for those responsibilities to to be pushed off by more more pressing things if you're in a in a busy and resource constrained environment. Um, and in terms of the recipients of the program, um, the um, engagement in the program was key. Um, and the things that affected that engagement were allowing time to build relationships with clients. So, um, in some of some of the interventions, um, with good examples. Um, of interventions, the planning for discharge actually started at the point that the person came into the institutional setting. So it wasn't that it was with a week or, or a few days before the person leaves that then we start the process of planning for discharge. It actually starts at the point of um, that the person comes into the institution so that there's enough time to build relationships with the client so that you actually get the chance to identify the individual's needs and preferences and then have enough time to be able to match with appropriate services for that person. Um, and I think the other point that emerged was that there was a recognition that um, access to secure and stable housing and non-housing support were both um, important. So it's not just about housing and it's not just about support, it's both of them together that um, were important for individuals who are um, engaging with the programs. Um, and time, providing enough information in good time um, was seen as, as really important, a very practical um, thing that can be improved. Um, people who are moving from an institutional setting, if they're only being told that they're moving with a couple of days or sometimes a couple of hours notice, there's just not enough time to actually secure um, suitable services and suitable um, accommodation for that. Person. So actually advanced planning and having enough time um, to put all of these things in place is really important. Um, and finally, and again, an obvious point, having services where and when people need them. So there's no point in running an amazing service that's only open from nine to five, Monday to Friday, and um, when people are being discharged from um, hospital at, at the weekend. They're not just they're just not going to be able to access the services in time. Um, so having things um, available to people in, in, at the time and place when they need them um, was important. Um, so to conclude for this review, the evidence um, is sparse um, and it is a varying quality. Um, so it kind of comes with a caveat, but it is promising. Um, the programmes did appear to improve um, housing stability quite a lot um, and improved health. Um, the programmes also might um, reduce reincarceration, but we need some more evidence um, to be sure of that. Um, they may be cost effective, but we do need more studies with them. Um, good cost benefit analyses and in a variety of contexts and institutions in different countries because of course the, the economic um, context will vary. Um, and the key features of the programmes appear to be advanced planning, coordination of multiple services um, for both housing and non-housing needs. Um, the really important um, was individualised support and services um, and investment in long-term support both before and after um, the point of discharge. That's that's me, and I'm going to um, hand over to Sarah. Thanks, Jen. I am going to do a really whistle-stop tour um, and just focus really on the conclusions. Um, 
of the, the improving access to health and social care services because we want to leave um, a few minutes for questions and I see some have already been um, posted in the chat so if you have more do, do post them. Um, one of the things I want to kind of emphasize is that these three reviews were very much a collaboration between ourselves, who have a lot of experience in doing systematic reviews, but also between people who are experts in the area of homelessness from the perspective of both an academic viewpoint, um, but also um, from a practitioner viewpoint as well. And we did have advisory groups that were advising us, as well as the author list you can see represents um, that as well. So people who are um, experiencing homelessness, we know have a much greater risk of poor physical and mental health outcomes. Um, and we also know that they face multiple barriers to actually physically accessing the services they need. So one of the things this um, review aimed to look at was whether services who make a concerted effort to change something about the service in order to make it more accessible to people, is that actually effective in improving access um, to these services? So the key thing for interventions being included in this review is that the, the, in, the service made a change to improve its accessibility and um, either by improving its collaboration with other services, improving its timeliness of delivery, um, educating health and social care professionals, for example, um, or adapting methods of communication. Um, and actually most of the interventions that are included in this review are um, uh, characteristically um, assertive community um, treatment where there's very much an individualized approach um, to uh, providing services for people who have multiple needs um, in, across a lot of different health and social care domains. So we wanted to know what was effective in improving access and did they work better for some than others? Um, and also again, uh, what implementation process factors um, were important. We adopted uh, a framework that tried to help us to understand how interventions might work. And it was across three dimensions, which was affordability, availability, and acceptability. And it's a framework that's been used previously by other authors. And we wondered, would this actually help us better understand the pathway through which these interventions are effective? As it turned out, um, most of the interventions were actually um, aimed at improving availability. So we weren't really able to categorize um, interventions in the way that we'd hoped. Um, but this was the framework that we started off with and trying to put that conception or that um, sort of theoretical understanding of how programs work is really important to us understanding, you know, um, to contribute to our understanding of what works. We don't want to just know what works, we want to know why and how we might be able to make it better. Essentially, this was one of the bigger reviews because it contained 73 um, papers. Most of the studies were from the US um, and as I said most improved or focused on improving um, the availability and accessibility um, of services. The quality of the research um, as with the other reviews was relatively low but what we did find is that these services are interventions that aim to improve accessibility um, can be effective. We saw a small to moderate effect size of 0.3 um, and you can see the confidence intervals uh, indicating the uncertainty or the imprecision of that um, estimate. But we also find that there were some improvements in other outcomes. Now we can't be sure because many of the interventions included as you might imagine are multi-component and have various different um, components um, to them, they're not just about improving access, they also provide um, other additional um, elements as well. And so we can't be sure that these secondary outcomes that we looked at are down to the fact that access was improved or whether there are other mechanisms at work. So we do have to kind of place that caveat around. But you can see that perhaps there were some promising indications um, of other outcomes being improved as a consequence of taking part in um, these types of interventions. We also um, looked at whether the interventions worked better for some people and um, some groups of people um, more than others, but unfortunately we just didn't have enough data to be able to answer those questions with any certainty. So it may well be the case that they do work better for some groups of people, but we can't tell that from this review. And we also looked at um, the qualitative papers um, as well, which really did find and echo some of the findings that Jen and Kira have highlighted as well, in terms of that importance of multidisciplinary teams and collaborations, both within 
organizations, but between external agencies um, as well. Um, we find really um, across all the reviews that there was some level of effectiveness, most certainly, and of course, a mixed bag as well, which is entirely typical when you do a systematic review. Not everything is in the one direction or is it obviously um, effective, but the complexity of these types of interventions is really important to understand. Um, and that sort of multi-component um, effect might be working in lots of different directions on lots of different outcomes. And one of the things that we wanted to kind of really pull out from the three reviews is that the majority of the effectiveness evidence was from the ESA. Now, that doesn't mean it's not important or relevant to UK context, but it is something we need to bear in mind when we're translating that evidence for here. We did find integrating the qualitative and the quantitative evidence a little bit of a challenge because they came from different studies and weren't necessarily, the qualitative evidence wasn't necessarily related to the studies that were included in the meta-analyses or the effectiveness part of the reviews. Um, and of course, every study and review probably ends with this call, but we really need more high quality primary evidence, uh, certainly in the UK and the European context, to be able to now add into these reviews, um, which will be able to sort of further our understanding of what works for whom and under what circumstances. And overall, just a quick word to say that actually, basing systematic reviews on the back of evidence and gap maps is a really good idea. And whilst we certainly find there were challenges with that, um, it's certainly a, an approach we would adopt in the future. And if you want to go and have a look at the evidence and gap maps, you're more than, they're publicly available on the Centre for Homelessness Impact website. And you can also, if you want to, look at selection of studies and uh, potentially do um, similar things to what we have done here. But I want to just end there. That was a little bit quick, um, but I'm gonna hand back over to Jennifer. The other thing to say is if you want to get in touch with us about any of these reviews, please do. We'd absolutely love to talk to you. And um, this review isn't published yet, but it will be soon. Um, and so look out for that, certainly. Anyway, Jen, back to you for some questions, hopefully. You. Um, yes, we've got some questions coming through in the chat, um, but if anybody would like um, to ask a question, you can just um, make a note in the chat or unmute yourself and, and jump in. Um, but we've, we've got a question um, from John McQuaid. Um, John has asked, were managed alcohol programs prevalent in Canada um, considered within the review, particularly in terms of housing stability? Um, Kira, I guess that would be for, um, for you for the accommodation. Yeah, that's not that's not um, a type of intervention that I recognise, John. So I don't I don't think that did appear in our in our reviews uh, in our view of accommodation. Um, yeah, I I had my eyes on every paper, and it's not it's not one I've I've rec I recognise the name of. Yeah, and similar for the um, discharge program, everything was in America rather than Canada. Um, so that not something that we had come across um, and there's one thing that maybe I should mention in terms of the studies included in this review they had to be focused on homelessness specifically rather than things that are about um, sort of alcohol treatment programs where homelessness wasn't really a primary issue so really it, it had to be focused on on homelessness um, in particular so maybe that's why we're not um, seeing them coming through and um, there was another question from um, Brendan Gribben what was the average cost of facilitating basic support accommodation um, say for a month for an individual and um, did the costs vary across countries um, and what element in terms of support would you say is most crucial um, which couldn't be measured by available metrics and couldn't be included in meta-analysis a great question Brendan. That, that's a really good question and that was something that we were really interested in Brendan for the accommodation base but it just wasn't possible to, to meaningfully um, quantitatively synthesize any of the cost and data that appeared um, and that's due just to the, the really diverse way that they've been described, collected and analysed. Um, but what we did do in the accommodation report was that we narratively described all the cost data that was available. Um, one of the things I should say, um, just it, it prompted my mind when, when Jen mentioned Canada, was that um, an overwhelming amount of the literature was the Shea Swa program um, in our accommodation review, um, which is, is a housing first um, 
type of intervention in, in Canada and they they present a really good cost um, data which would be most um, comparable I guess for our um, high support unconditional interventions versus the the basic support um, unconditional interventions so um, housing first against I guess the shelter program which I think the question is that you're asking um, and, and what they found in their analysis was that um, there was an offset of about $2, um, which benefited the intervention group. So it actually, you know, cost less over long term um, to, to provide individuals with a high support comparing to just putting them into a hostel and not providing um, any kind of future life support. Um, and then there was another question, Jen, about... Um, um, yeah, so um, Sarah um, McNeil, Sarah, um, if you want to unmute um, yourself and you can ask your question, um, but it's just in the chat here, Sarah is a new PhD student um, looking at health outcomes for homelessness, um, specifically in Northern Ireland. Um, so did you find through your view that there were more effective or popular health outcomes that were used? Um, and also what homeless typology did you find was used most um, commonly or was most effective? And I, I think all three of us can probably jump in um, on that one. And in terms of the discharge review, the health outcomes that were used was generally focused on hospitalization. Um, so it would have been the number of hospitalizations within a specific period of time. So for some studies, the follow-up was maybe 90 days. For some studies, it was a full year. So it was the number of times somebody went back into hospital um, during a period of time. I can't think offhand if there were any other specific outcomes. And because, the, because of the diversity in the populations that were included, in the interventions, you know, it may be that for some groups, physical health is the most important outcome and for others, um, it may be um, addiction outcomes and things like that. So it depends on the individual study and um, what health outcomes were measured. There were in the drug and alcohol use was also measured um, in quite a few of the studies. And again, it would have been either kind of a snapshot measure. So um, amount of use within the past week and um, for example or it might have been sort of number of instances over a period of time so it's measured in in different ways um and in terms of a typology i mean i think care is probably best place to answer that one essentially we, there wasn't one that we could readily identify so Kira. yeah the, the the most common that we found was the high unconditional so the, that that's most similar i guess to housing first um, but just a uh, health warning that the, the that Shea Swa program um, has a lot of literature now and really you know high quality um, randomized control trials. So so that could be why we found so many of those. Um, Jen, if you don't mind, Brendan also asked a question just around the the, the support um, provided to individuals, which I which I think is another great question. Um, and and what we found was that. Um, th that type of really individualized support. So the caseworker getting to know the, the individual at risk of or experiencing homelessness was really important um, and tailoring the response to their needs. Um, and that seemed to be, you know, an effective component across the accommodation interventions. Thank you. Um, we don't have any more questions in the chat. Is there anybody who'd like to, to ask a question? I think that's I think that's us then unless anyone else has any questions um we have I've sent I've added the links um to both of the um, reports for the accommodation and discharge um reviews and then if you keep an eye um on the Centre for Homelessness Impact the um access review will be published um in the next few weeks I believe um and do please get in touch with us um via Twitter or you can email us at the the centre and um, but it's been a pleasure to talk to you all this morning and thank you all very much for joining thanks everyone thank you